The Autism Research Institute depends on the generosity of its donors, like you, to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. This is a rapidly evolving field, um, but I'll say in the, out, in the outset that, you know, really over the last um, probably six months and through um, the facilitation offered by, um, you know, the two, two major um, autism groups that I've been affiliated with, so um, Autism Research Institute and Autism Speaks, it's been clear that we, that we can distinguish um, primary mitochondrial disease um, and secondary mitochondrial dysfunction then and it really the vast majority of uh, children with aut autism um, spectrum disorders uh, will not have a primary mitochondrial um, disease defect uh, that may only affect one to four percent of children with um, primary with autism spectrum disorders and the remaining may have um, ecogenetic forms of mitochondrial dysfunction. I'll, I'll say that word again, ecogenetic, because I'm going to finish my talk with that word <laughs> um, and how uh, that, um, what, what the implications for the interaction between our in ancestrally transmitted um, gene set, uh, you know, that um, um, we've received from, from our ancestors who had to interact with their environment, the, the foods in their environment, and the microbes in their environment, the viruses and bacteria and fungi in their environment. Um, and, you know, as you might imagine, only those individuals survived to reproduce that had the genetic um, capacity to handle the, the changes that occurred um, in the environment and the, and the various infectious agents, you know, that existed um, in uh, where our ancestors uh, originated. So, um, many years ago, I put together a, a slide just to indicate, you know, all the different um, uh, medical manifestations that can occur with um, primary forms of mitochondrial disease, um, and they can um, range from muscular dystrophy clinics, epilepsy clinics, you know, leukodystrophy, bipolar depression, schizophrenia, sudden infant death. But we're really going to be focusing you know, on uh, autism spectrum disorders here. So, uh, in the beginning there was a honeybee, okay, and this, this honeybee um, was absolutely essential for the, uh, maintaining the entire health of, of an ecosystem. Um, that honeybee is not unlike mitochondria within our cells, and our cells um, are the ecosystem, and mitochondria are constantly, you know, uh, measuring the chemistry and the physical environment in which they reside, the oxygen content, the temperature, the pH, the presence of var various nutrients. Um, and in response to that, they actually send out signals continuously to the nucleus, to peroxisomes, to other cells. They're constantly communicating, updating, um, you know, neighboring cells, you know, um, organelles within the cell in which they reside. And for about 50 years, um, mitochondrial specialists or biochemists have been cracking open cells and, and pulling out the mitochondria and studying them like a little honeybee in a glass flask, you know, where we can identify all the different, um, uh, you know, proteins in a mitochondrion, um, identify over 500 different functions that they, they perform. Um, but uh, until we actually evaluate their function in the context of the whole cell and then you know ultimately in the whole individual we do not understand the function of mitochondria okay it's much more than just oxygen consumption and ATP production um, and I'll go through some of the some of those things okay so mitochondria create the words the chemicals that cells use to communicate the mitochondria sense and regulate the internal environment of the cell they adapt the cell to the changing environmental conditions the cells need about 1,500 different genes that are specifically targeted to, to mitochondria for mitochondrial biogenesis. There is no such thing as a single mitochondrion. They are constantly fusing and fissioning from one another. Okay? Um, one in 2,000 children born will develop definite forms of mitochondrial disease in their lifetimes. We'll call those the primary forms of mitochondrial dysfunction. 
about 10 to 20 percent of those definite forms may have, uh, you know, a, an endophenotype um, that uh, qualifies for a diagnosis of, of autism spectrum disorder, but only one to four percent of all ASDs, you know, will qualify as a primary mitochondrial disorder, and that means that really 96 to 99 percent are not primary mitochondrial disorders. Um, why is it, and then uh, animal mitochondrial biology is a, a kind of, is what I call the secret life of mitochondria. In my view, um, the cellular defense functions of mitochondria were actually more ancient. So, they are, so um, with the first eukaryogenic event that occurred uh, dating back to as, as far back as 2.5 billion years ago, or as recently as uh, 0.9 billion years ago, single, a single cell uh, free living uh, bacterium um, uh, that consumed oxygen w was w fused with a, a, a um, archaeobacterium to produce the first single cell eukaryotic cell. So the Precambrian seas were just awash with the bacteria and viruses and then eventually with single cell eukaryotes. And in that time, the only single cell eukaryotes that could pass on their genes to the next you know, um, generation were the ones that could survive this complex microbial ecosystem in the in the oceans that be able to survive the viral infections you know survive the you know the parasitic viral infections okay and for single cells single cells can do just fine on glycolysis they don't need mitochondria for energy production okay you just don't need it it's you know really you need mitochondria for energy production when you start putting multiple cells together to make you know animals and plants Okay. So with the Cambrian explosion, that's when you know, the real hidden value of mitochondria um, uh, really um, uh, became apparent. And, and it was so powerful, it, it, you know, is, you know, now its remnants are all, you know, everything that we see today in, this, um, you know, in our living world. So mitochondria produced the first danger signals. And let's see, so, so some of these... It, some functions I'll just you know, briefly go over. Oxygen consumption is an obligate function of mitochondria, but ATP synthesis is a, an inducible function. It is not something they have to do all the time. Okay? Uh, mitochondria can regulate their ATP production through uncoupling proteins. They can regulate it through a variety of different other mechanisms, including nitric oxide synthesis. Um, uh, so they, they don't have to make ATP. Folate, B12, S-N-acyl methionine, methionine, cysteine, glutathione metabolism, all you know, um, uh, you know, um, are uh, regulated in, in part through mitochondrial metabolism. Cellular redox, which is perhaps uh, the major determinant of intracellular metabolism, um, is uh, fundamentally controlled by mitochondria. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, perhaps the primary the two things that, that influence redox more than anything else are basically our diet and nutrient intake and our exercise level, okay? And then after that, it's the mitochondria that work with that. <laughs> Crosstalk with peroxisomes, glycolate and oxalate metabolism, the work capacity of the cell and its dis the, their growth capacity and their uh, decision to commit cellular suicide, apoptosis, you know, during cellular development, we have to prune out a lot of neurons and synaptic connections. We have to prune out a lot of cells, and mitochondria are intimately involved in that, you know, that pruning process. Nucleotide synthesis. So, actually, um, the four step in de novo primitive biosynthesis to hydroorotate dehydrogenase, um, and that's uh, has to send off, has to, you know, um, uh, send electrons to the um, mitochondrial inner membrane electron transport chain. And that's responsible for making all the U's, T's, and C's of the cell. But, you know, and you already know about ATP, but GTP is also made in mitochondria. And, uh, and these nucleotides don't just have energy carrying ca characteristics. You know, you know that they're informational molecules with, once they're polymerized into DNA and RNA, but it turns out they're also informational molecules as monomers, you know, extracellularly. So once extracellular ATP, you know, um, well, once cells, cells actually will produce extracellular ATP and it binds to receptors, and I'll talk to that in the rest of the talk. So cholesterol, cortisol, steroid hormone synthesis, vitamin D activation, inactivation, porphyrin iron cluster synthesis, heme biosynthesis, calcium iron copper metabolism, 
uh, and the first committed steps of innate immunity. All these are mitochondrial functions. Oh, and the one that, that frequently gets omitted is uh, meiotic recombination. So if you take a, you know, a baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and you make a row zero cell, pull out the mitochondrial DNA, um, one of the, the most profound defects that you um, observe is that now those, those, those cells cannot sporulate. They cannot produce gametes. Okay. Um, it also seems to be the, um, uh, at the heart of um, why a number of hybrid crosses, for example, between you know, um, a horse and a donkey um, give rise to a mule that is sterile because of the incompatibility of the mitochondria carried from a horse you know, with the, the, the nuclear DNA um, uh, you know, carried from uh, the, uh, the donkey. Okay. There are lots of examples of these things that are kind of arcane, um, but fun. <laughs> All right. So remember, there are two always two reasons, two ways that, that the cell can produce energy. Um, the most ancient um, is glycolysis, which is um, uh, ATP production and I'll just, let me go to this one, so I'll start. So uh, ATP production in the absence of oxygen um, using glucose and, you know, um, basically, you know, so with one glucose, one, with six carbons of glucose, you can make two ATPs, net and a lactate and two lactates. Okay, um, the, that also happens when, you know, when, so when we injure ourselves, if we sprain our ankle and the cells, and our cells start swelling, we shift our metabolism. Our cells shift from, you know, a, a, an aerobic metabolism to a glycolytic metabolism. Um, it happens after strokes and MIs, um, and that turns out that metabolic shift and then the, the res restoration of aerobic metabolism after that shift is made um, that is associated with healing is an important part of regenerative medicine biology. Another interesting thing about glycolysis, it's highly inducible. It, it, glycolysis can be induced 1,000 fold over baseline levels. If you take Usain Bolt at, at you know, the starting line of the, uh, of the Olympic uh, 100 meter dash, you know, measure his glycolytic, you know, activity at that time, you can call it, you know, one. Um, you know, at the end of a 100, 100 meter dash, he's working at a level of 1,000. Was that me? What was? Oh. <laughs> Anyway, that's, yeah, so, so congratulations to Usain. But anyway, so, so, the, the, so, so you can rapidly induce, you know, um, uh, glycolytic ATP production. Now, what about this other, you know, method that, you know, is so important of using oxygen um, to produce ATP? This is more like the hare in the, or excuse me, the, the tortoise as in, in the tortoise and the hare race. Okay, so, so um, oxidative, so aerobic, metabolism and the production of ATP is about 50 times slower. It runs about 2% of the capacity of uh, glycolytic energy metabolism. But it turns out that speed of ATP production is not critical. It's the efficiency. When you go through a winter and calories are restricted, you know, the people that survive at the end of that winter are the people that were able to eke out the, the, the very last amount of ATP from what they had stored in terms of you know, their, the, their fat reserves. Okay. This, and then when you exercise, we can only induce the, the aerobic metabolism of a mitochondria about two to three fold. Okay. So, so it's not a thousand fold inducible, it's two to three fold inducible. Nonetheless, it plays, there are a lot of other, you know, roles that it plays, and we can go through that. So bump, 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 two ways to make, you know, <laughs> make energy. Okay, mitochondria are made from about 1,500 genes. That means that the, the proteins involved, um, uh, to, to, so for in mitochondrial biogenesis, um, uh, are spread all throughout the, the 23 chromosomes. There are only 13 uh, proteins that are made and are encoded by mitochondrial DNA. All the others are, are made um, in the nucleus and as such are all subject to tissue-specific gene expression. So. The, the, the genes expressed um, in the nucleus for mitochondria in a retinal cone cell are completely different than, well not completely different, but very different from the, the, um, the genes expressed uh, um, in the nucleus of a, a liver cell or a kidney epithelial cell or a you know, neuron of the CA1 region of the hippocampus. Or in white cells. <laughs> Um, so each one of the, the, those 1,500 genes can be considered to be 
controlled by something akin to an audio mixer where every channel can go up and down uh, according to, to different programs. And these genes are, again, pro, you know, come from different chromosomes. The mitochondria perform about 500 different mitochondrial functions. And the genes are red regulated um, uh, coordinately for some sets of genes and discoordinately for others. You can't, you know, make you know, predictions about, you know, this person had increased mitochondrial function or decreased mitochondrial function. That kind of loses meaning when you got 500 mitochondrial functions to talk about. All right. So 500 different mitochondria. So every, so let's so so in the human body plan we have about 500 differentiated terminally differentiated cell types. There is a different mitochondrion specialized for every one of those cells. Okay, so you know it's it's a they they are adapted to meet the metabolic demands of each individual cell type. So if I had a pointer, I'd point out some of these different, you know, mitochondria here that come from on the upper left. Uh, oh, yeah, this is another thing. When we crack open, you know, cells and pull out mitochondria, what happens? Mitochondria normally are present in filaments, but when we snap them apart, pull them out of the cell, they snap into, like, uh, little spheres, um, according to soap bubble physics. Um, and uh, so you, you lose their normal configuration when you crack open the cell as well. And what we've learned is that actually dramatically influences is their function. Their function when they're in long filaments and networks within a cell are very different from when they're just in little balls. And we're always measuring just the function in little balls. Okay? And so this is you know, what we'll call the spaghetti and meatball, meatball transformation between mitochondria. Okay? So just below that top left slide is uh, you know, a slide that also has some spherical mitochondria, but if you note the Christi inside, they're, they're much more sparse. That we those, that actually are those are the mitochondria within a primary oocyte, okay? So an egg, and uh, an egg will contain um, about um, well anywhere from two hundred thousand to two million of these little balls, and each one of these little balls will have about one mitochondrial DNA. It's a little bit different than the normal situation, okay? Where we mitochondrial you know will usually be associated in nucleoids with five to seven mitochondrial DNAs at a minimum. Okay, well I won't spend too much more time on this. I'll go through. So, oh yeah, the, on the right. Okay, so on the right we have um, a, a line and dot model of intermediary metabolism, and that's just to remind me to tell you that um, first of all. Uh, not every cell does every reaction that is present on this, you know, on, on that diagram on the right. Part of the metazoan, you know, solution to complexity was specialized. So when certain cells, uh, you know, um, differentiate to become neurons or, or retinal cells or, or pancreatic beta islet cells, um, they give up certain metabolic reactions so that they can do others better. Okay, this is something that Adam Smith, you know, identified and was the basis of the Industrial Revolution. It's something that, that Henry T. Ford, you know, um, uh, in you know, kind of uh, brought to commercial success in, in creating the first assembly line, where each component was was. A, you know, of uh, the car of the Model T Ford was produced by a specialist in you know wheels and frame and engine lights, and, um, and none of those people could actually put together the whole car. Okay, but together they worked to produce something that ne had never been be been made before. Okay, so that's where our mitochondria are helping out. So, so mitochondria don't do all these things in all the different cells, but they do 90% of the catabolic reactions and 70% of the anabolic reactions pass through mitochondria at some point. All right. So mitochondria also adapt to genetic, you know, and environmental changes. So you can have a primary defect. So these, if you you know, imagine. A few of the mitochondrial functions, I may have about 30 of mitochondrial functions, you know, uh, uh, you know imaged um, here. And let's say we inherit a defect that produces, you know, an abnormality in one. Well, that produces a cascade of compensatory abnormalities um, that result in decreases and increases in certain functions. To, and finally, we have some function that is, you know, related to a high order symptom that we might see that might be seizures, you know, or might be, you know, uh, you know, the susceptibility of the gut to particular allergens, um, okay? So, uh, or immunoreactivity, you know, the overstimulation. Um, uh, so, so, 
And that turns out to be the, the actual cause of the symptom, but in certain mitochondrial disease, you'll have a primary defect. Or you can imagine that that could be caused by some environmental you know, exposure, okay? some environmental agent. All right, so the treatments to, you know, that's, that's effective is you know, directing at the proximate cause of, of the symptoms in the secondary disorder. Many of the primary defects in genetic disorders we, are not really amenable to treatment. Okay, you can have an increase. For example, you can duplicate, you know, chromosome 15 Q11, and that will produce another cascade of, you know, effects. Okay, and you can measure all those, but you know that can produce also symptoms that were the same as that were produced by the first set of, you know, abnormalities as I showed. And so you can have a treatment that actually can be effective for some, you know, a symptom that is caused by several different things. Okay. All right. Mitochondria are dynamic. They're, they're, we, you know, they're continuously fusing and fissioning. So on the right, you'll see a green mitochondrion that um, will fuse um, uh, and exchange its contents with you know, the, the red-marked mitochondria. You can follow this green one again. It's going to you know, go ahead and um, touch. And we call it the kiss and run. They'll, they'll actually they'll, uh, they'll fuse and then they'll fission. They share mitochondrial DNA. They share proteins with one another. That's continuously going on. Um, when cells are exposed to progressive gradients of stress, what happens is you go from a most, most of the filamentous or tubular, you see down in B, um, at this panel in B, um, mostly tubular mitochondria. As you increasingly um, expose the cells to increasing magnitudes of stress or metabolic deprivation, nutrient deprivation, heat shock, pH shock, oxygen shock, what will happen is you progress to more and more spherical mitochondria. <laughs> okay? So the mitochondria fragment. And interestingly, one of the first things you can see when a cell commits to apoptosis structurally are fragmented mitochondria. Okay? That happens even before um, the, the, the flip of the, the phosphatidyl serine from the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane to the outer leaflet of, mito of the, the plasma membrane that is detected by a nexin 5, a common you know, marker of apoptosis. All right, the language of metabolism is, the language of the cell is metabolism. Now, this is a very busy slide, and I really wish I had a, um, a, uh, a pointer. But let's start at the top, and I'll just walk you through. So the substrates that this cell will consume are glucose and lipids. And those are actually processed by mitochondria that are specialized um, for carbohydrate metabolism or fatty acid metabolism. Mitochondria are then producing, so if you look at the left-hand mitochondrion, it produces mitochondrial DNA under conditions of stress. It will release mitochondrial DNA and it will fragment and release pieces of itself and peptides that are actually inflammatory. So that's what the little flame is there, is to, to indicate you know, inflammation. And so those, um, and it's by virtue of the fact that um, mitochondrial proteins frequently start with a formulated methionine, okay, um, just like bacteria, that um, that pieces of it can be recognized, you know, as as foreign and will activate um, uh, the uh, the um, early innate immune responses um, uh, and will actually recruit in recruit phagocytes. Okay, so on the other, go a little bit farther down there, you'll see. Um, a little graph that says EATP, so there's a happy, happiness point, and I'll call this, so there's the principle of metabolic, you know, metabolic matching that I'd like to, to you know, to, um, uh, let's see, develop. And, and when, it, when a cell um, is in an environment that meets all of its nutritional and physical um, uh, needs, mitochondria will produce um, a, a set of small molecules um, that include things you know, that, you know, like ATP, but also include things like um, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinate, um, and other molecules that get sent to, to, to the, the nucleus and will get sent outside the cell that participate in, that actually create a little halo around the cell of high concentration, and that halo glows with a color that says, I'm well. <laughs> okay. And when the, when the cell finds itself in a hostile environment, when it's exposed to you know, um, a 
any environmental chemical, whether it's you know mercury, cadmium, um, uh, or this is um, you know poly polybrominated you know um, uh, di diphenyl ethers um, uh, as flame retardants, um, uh, you you will produce a change in the metabolic function of the mitochondria and will change the small molecule words that they use to communicate with you know, the nucleus and neighboring cells. So, um, so anyway, so the principle of metabolic matching determines the dialogue that cells use to, to talk to one another and will uh, you know, will be the early alarm system um, in any uh, um, exposure to either a viral infection, bacterial infection, fungal infection, you know, or changes in um, nutrition or micronutrients. All right, so there are two complementary and conflicting states of mitochondrial function. Um, in dividing cells on the left, what you have is, um, excuse me, non-dividing cells on the left, uh, what you have um, are the classically you know, understood mitochondrial functions of taking, taking glucose or food, which is really you know, sources of electrons, and converting those, burning those down to CO2 and water. So you're taking, taking carbon skeletons, burning them to CO2 and water, and making ATP. Um, so that has a name called anaplerotic function, so anaplerosis, and, um, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but, but in the next, so on the right-hand side, we have cells that are dividing. So these cells need to, to not completely burn glucose to CO2 and water. If these, if growing cells, so remember, growing cells have to double their biomass every day. They have to make more phospholipid. You know, they have to make more nucleotides. They have to make, you know, more protein every day. Okay, and that requires carbon skeletons. So if you're taking your carbon skeletons and burning them completely to CO2 and water, that's the end of cell growth. Okay, you can't do it. <laughs> All right, you need a different function of mitochondria, and that's called their cataplerotic function. That's where substrates, foods will come into intermediary metabolism pass through a, a step or two of the Krebs cycle and then come out as a carbon skeleton that can be used for amino acid synthesis, nucleotide synthesis, and fatty acid synthesis. So, okay, so the evolutionary origins of this, you know, I'll just briefly go over it. So during the, so our ancestors, ancestors had to deal with seasonal differences in availability of calories. In the winter, Calories were limiting. That's on the right-hand column here. So calories were limiting. You had to work hard in order to get adequate calories. Okay, and there are certain hormones that were associated with um, you know uh, th that you know low-calorie um, existence. I won't go too much into that, other than to go down to the this you know, the, the line that says glycolysis. Okay, well glycolysis during the winter is really low. You, this is the this is the time when the tortoise wins out. Okay, the tortoise is making the best use of available you know carbon skeletons in the in the form. Of of fatty acid depots, adipose depots, okay, and that's how you make it through. In addition, you upregulate autophagy, okay, so autophagy is much upregulated during, during um, our ancestral winter. One of the problems of human disease now is we're in an eternal summer, an endless summer, okay. We don't have cycles of nutrients anymore, okay, through, through winter and summer, and so we have now, I'll flip to the next, you know, to the so the first column, where calories during the summer or during the daytime, calories are plentiful, and you don't have to work so hard for your calories anymore. And glycolysis under those conditions is high, and mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation is low, and cataplerosis is you know, um, very high, so you're, you're, you're actually in a cell growth state. Okay, and cell growth manifests in adults as obesity, and in, you know, in children, it can produce... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce another term called de developmental dyschronia. It'll, it, this is a, it, because of the correlated growth requirements of embry em embryogenesis, it is necessary to actually have cells move along developmental trajectories together so that when one neuron gets to, to one place or sends out a projection, another neuron's ready to, to make the catch. It's kind of like a um, trapeze, you know, trapeze artist. And if, and if that, and if, you know, um, the, 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 the catcher um, uh, doesn't, you know, is not at the right place, ah, we do have something that's been here. Okay, I'm, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, that you're not going to make the catch, and those neuronal projections are, are going to um, uh, fail. <laughs>
Okay? So, so anyway, so that's kind of a little brief overview about the summer and winter functions of mitochondria that are played out in another scale during the day when we eat and the night when we don't. You know, there are small, smaller variations in that. And that's also associated with small vari variations, circadian variations in NAD and NADH, and as well as circadian variations in cholesterol biosynthesis, et cetera. So, that, so I'll leave it at that. All right. So anaplerosis, these, so that's Hans Krebs on the left. Well, yeah, so Hans Krebs um, is on the left in the 1940s. He worked out this cycle after working out the urea cycle, interestingly, first. Okay, so he did the urea cycle also. Um, and he studied the flight muscles of pigeons. Okay, so these are, these are um, pigeons have dark meat, okay, as opposed to your, ch your chickens and and, uh, and, and turkeys that have white meat. So white meat are fast switch fibers that are for ra rapid burst glycolysis. So, so, so evolution placed uh, fast switch fibers in, in, in those animals um, in order to um, uh, help them fly away from the fox. Okay? Um, whereas migratory birds um, you know, like uh, ducks and pigeons use this, this um, form of, of use, you know, slow twitch fibers that used um, anaplerotic intermediary metabolism where you take things like pyruvate and fatty acids, aspartate and glutamate and branched chain amino acids and you burn them all to CO2 and water, <laughs> making ATP. Cataplerosis is um, the complement. This is what's used in, you know, for, for actually taking in a few things and then bring, spitting them out. So methylmalonyl-CoA gets spit out um, through succinyl-CoA to make heme. Um, you can also uh, use pyruvate to make glucose through gluconeogenesis. Um, anyway, so the b main theme is in anaplerosis, you're actually consuming like a, a great... Uh, um, uh, I, I hesitate to use the, the the term tornado at this particular point, but but um, but but uh, you know, like a like a um, a great vortex that pulls things in and then and then you know in the case of mitochondria, burn them to CO2 and water. And cataplerosis is where you actually take things in and then you provide you know uh, building blocks for cell growth. Okay, mitochondria can so so can. So I told you before that, you know, so ATP is um, a, an inducible function of mitochondria. It, it occurs at the point of, you know, the, the fifth complex in the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Um, this is a rotary catalyst. It, it actually turns, you know, in order to make ATP. Um, the, the energy um, that is used to, to make ATP is stored as a proton motive force in this inner mitochondrial membrane space and it normally would flow down um, through a, a proton pore in, in, in this channel. Okay. Um, and uh, so, and, and what, what will, um, so, so, and we can act, uh, our, our cells can actually regulate the amount of ATP by um, regulating the amount of uncoupling protein that, that you know, will actually uh, disperse this proton motive force, so UCPs. And there are other, other mechanisms too that will, um, uh, will, will you know, downshift mitochondria um, and uh, you know, allow them not to produce um, as much ATP. But under, in, under injury conditions, you can even have mitochondria that will consume ATP. Okay, so mitochondria, I mentioned, you know, once you, you have cellular damage after a stroke, a heart attack, or a sprained ankle, or a cut in a wound, um, will shift their metabolism from aerobic metabolism to glycolytic metabolism. Okay, that's actually really quite, you know, adaptive, because if you've severed your you know, blood supply, and you can't get, you know, very much oxygen, you only have a little bit of glucose coming in from, you know, uh, collateral vessels, it's very useful to be able to make enough energy to survive without, you know, consuming oxygen, and that's done by glycolysis, <laughs> okay? Um, it, but those damaged mitochondria will, can actually take ATP made from glycolysis um, on the, and import it into the, in, into the organelle and start turning the ATP synthase in the opposite direction, okay, to pump protons back in to the inner membrane space, okay, to maintain the mitochondrial membrane potential, to maintain the charge in the membrane. Why is that important? Okay, why? So it's important because 
the way that mitochondria tell the nucleus that they need supplies is by keeping the porch light on. Okay, so the porch light, right? So by maintaining the charge, so remember there are 1,500 different proteins that have to get imported into mitochondria, okay? How do, so how do they find mitochondria? They find them according to the charge on the mitochondrial membrane, okay? So, you, so, so even if, yeah, so I'll just say, only charged mitochondria are resupplied. When mitochondria turn out the lights, when the membrane potential goes to zero, they don't get any new protein, okay? Oh yeah, and then they're essential for de novo permanent biosynthesis. I already mentioned that. This enzyme dehydroorotate dehydrogenase on the inner mitochondrial membrane produces erotic acid that then is a substrate for um, uh, uridine monophosphate uh, synthase or, or UMP. And then th that UMP is then a source for all the T's and the C's you know, um, that are used for RNA DNA synthesis and for car carbohydrate activation for glycogen metabolism. All right, so what are the, here are the so many faces of mitochondrial disease. There are over 300 genetically distinct forms of mitochondrial disease. Each one of these has a little bit different mitochondrial disease. You know, um, it's common for mitochondrial disease children to be, you know, normal at birth. You know, here you can see the little, you know, the little girls in their, their Easter outfits. Um, both those girls actually had a disease called Alpers syndrome. Um, and one, one of the things that each one of these children, um, you know, even though they, they all have uh, different disorders, different primary causes, um, uh, the thing that connects them is none of them survived past 10 years of life. Okay. Okay, so let's... So I'm going to um, skip to the chase here and say that um, basically the, um, the free... The, the, incidence of mitochondrial disease is one in 2,000 live births, but only a half of those will present before the age of 10, so that's one in, one in 4,000, and half of them will present with symptoms after the age of 10. How do you diagnose it? We have something called the modified Walker criteria. It, um, we use a, um, a, a gradient of um, a disease um, severity to, to define the categories of mitochondrial disease and definite mitochondrial disease um, criteria have been selected to help us identify primary forms of mitochondrial disease. These are monogenic forms typically, okay, genetic forms. It allows us to you know, provide you know, um, uh, family counseling for the, for the patients and in some cases uh, allows uh, the development of specific treatments. Um, in, so I'll bring out this last little square that, that um, first of all, it requires um, for an, a, a, a definite diagnosis, you need either DNA or a muscle biopsy. And in the muscle biopsy, the level of electron transport chain deficiency has to be 20% or less. Okay. It's being changed a little bit now, but um, I'll, I, I'll leave it at this for now. That's not what we normally see in, in um, children with autism who usually will have, if they have mitochondrial um, dysfunction, they will have um, higher residual levels of, of mitochondrial um, uh, proteins. And in some cases, we'll actually have increases in mitochondrial proteins. So, so mitochondrial disease and autism are not the same. Um, so children with mitochondrial disease are present. They will, um, in about one in, well, one in 4,000 children will present before the age of 10. They typically have decreased hearing, decreased sensation to touch, decreased movement, decreased immune response, multi-organ dysfunction, and catastrophic setbacks, uh, and, um, with, often with infection, when progressive disease. Autism doesn't share many of those except for in, in select cases, okay? So autism is really a triad of disorders involving uh, neurodevelopment, brain, GI tract. Oh yeah, so I should make that point right away. So from an evolutionary point of view, um, uh, there's an argument to be made that um, our brain is actually our second brain. And what we, so, so, so um, in the, during the, the Cambrian and the, uh, the development of the first multicellular organisms, for, imagine the, the sea anemone. Sea anemone has a, you know, a GI tract that is coordinated by uh, a, the equivalent of a myenteric plexus, in which, you know, where, where the coordination of, you know, its GI tract, um, uh, you know, was regulated by neurons and by actual um, neurotransmitters and peptides that that eventually became co-opted with evolution to a site of you know greater brain greater neuronal d d developments um, in what we call today our brain. Okay, but the gut, you know, 
from an evolutionary point of view, was our first brain. <laughs> and, you know, our brain is really our second brain. And that's why there's so many connections between the two is because they're, you know, father and son. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so mitochondrial dysfunction in autism spectrum disorders. This is a really nice review by, um, you know, uh, by, by Dan Rosignol and Richard Fry, who, you know, really... They, uh, did a did a fantastic job of kind of culling together the papers that looked at mitochondrial disease and autism, and uh, so and what in this paper there was a, a five percent um, uh, five percent of the children with um, autism spectrum disorders were characterized as having definite mitochondrial disease. Okay, that's a bit on the high side, and I'll show you you know why that. So so then the the flip side of that is ninety five percent did not have a purely genetic you know, mitochondrial disease, okay? So, um, and, uh, you know, but the problem with both autism and mitochondrial disease is there's an irreducible clinical heterogeneity, okay? It's very difficult to, to take, um, to do a, a, a clinical trial with relatively small numbers of, of subjects because, you know, if you met one child with autism, you met one child with autism. If you met one child with mitochondrial disease, you met one child with mitochondrial disease, okay? So this kind of brings up this, uh, the point of elevated citrate synthase, I'll make a point of this, um, is uh, citrate synthase is only found in mitochondria. It's a marker of mitochondrial mass, okay? When mitochondrial have primary defects, frequently there's a strong compensatory effort to increase the amount of mitochondria, okay? So, so, um, so, so 44 or nearly half of the children with primary forms of mitochondrial disease, you know, had um, a compensatory increase in mitochondrial function in about a quarter of children with ASD. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm not, so I'll make a brief, you know, lactate is frequently used, and lactate pyruvate ratios are frequently used. Um, but one of the difficulties of this is particularly, you know, pronounced in children with autism is they don't like to have their blood drawn, okay? And they will squirm and fight and, you know, and, um, and one of the things that we really have a problem with is um, very little muscle activity in a child is sufficient to raise blood lactate significantly. Okay. Now, it turns out that can actually be used as a stress test because it takes, if you have primary mitochondrial disease, it takes a lower amount of stress to raise the lactate, but it's still a complicated thing to interpret. <laughs> okay. All right. And, and so only about half of the children with real mitochondrial disease have elevated lactates, but, you know, three quarters of the children, um, you know, with uh, ASD and mitochondrial disease, you know, had elevations. And I'll leave it there. Okay. So I made a point about the, the, the epidemiology of mitochondrial disease and talking to you about, you know, that, um, you know, one, about one in 4,000 children will have definite mitochondrial disease. And I'll point out that it's actually mathematically impossible for, um, for, for, you know, one in 4,000 is children to, to have known mitochondrial disease um, and 4% 4, 4 of the children with autism to have mitochondrial disease, okay? So I'll just run through this. So if you take an imaginary population of 100,000 children um, and take 1% of those as having autism, well, let's see if I can do it from here. Okay, so the assumption is 1%, and everybody agrees with that. That's not a, you know, that's not something that's in dispute, okay? 1% of children um, will have autism spectrum disorder. So that means that 1,000 out of 100,000 children will have ASD, okay? So ASD. Um, and then if you take the, the assumption that the prevalence of mitochondrial disease within autism is 4.2%, as, you know, um, as suggested by a paper by uh, Olivieri, um, which is really one of the first that kind of looked at this in a, in a larger study, um, it was 4.2%. Uh, yeah, and the prevalence of mitochondrial disease from our experience with, uh, within mitochondrial disease is that if you take this whole spectrum of mitochondrial disease, it's only this, the last quartile, and you know, really the last 10 to 20% of the children who have the mildest forms of mitochondrial disease that can even you know, ha be meaningfully tested for, um, you know, for, uh, you know, to, to meet criteria for um, autism spectrum disorder. For, so for, and I'll tell you that the other parts you know, of the children that, that you know, um, have the even more severe multi-organ, you know, dysfunction, you know, um, yes, language delay is an issue, but that's a higher order function that is commonly common in a lot of different neurocognitive abnormalities. But social, the, there's, their, their socialization is actually very good, okay? So it's not, so, so the majority of mitochondrial children do not have, you know, social engagement abnormalities. 
But, okay, so getting back to this. So it turns out that if we say that 4.2% that 4.2% uh, of 1,000 is 42 kids, but we already know there are only 25 children out of, a, out of 100,000 that have mitochondrial disease, okay? So it's just mathematically impo impossible. So, so how do you resolve that? Um, well, you can reduce the, the, the prevalence of real definite mitochondrial disease within autism, um, and this is a study that came out recently by Corrigan and Dager um, that uh, looked at proton uh, MRS um, in order to look for um, characteristics of mitochondrial dysfunction in the brains of children, um, 54 children with autism. And in those cases, basically zero, zero of the, of the, of the kids had characteristics uh, you know, that were associated with primary mitochondrial disease. Now, some kids did have elevated lactates in their brain, but it wasn't any different from the controls. Okay. All right. All right. So now how do we, you know, come to grips with this? So let's keep, you know, the prevalence of autism spectrum at 1%, but let's low, lower the prevalence of mitochondrial disease within autism, you know, so, and again, this is definite genetic forms of mitochondrial disease. Um, and uh, let's keep the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder as an endophenotype within, you know, mitochondrial disease at close to 10 to 20%. Now, when you do that, Oh yeah, and, you know, so let, and let's also change. Let's let's lower the rigor with which we you know identify definite mitochondrial disease, um, and call this probable or possible mitochondrial disease. And now, when you what you do is you know we actually come to something that's a little more compatible. So so we have you know a uh, thousand children out of a hundred thousand that have autism. And let's say that you know one percent of those have mitochondrial disease, and then uh, you know and then forty children um, will have mitochondrial disease without autism. And so you end up with a total of 50 children out of 100,000 with possible or probable mitochondrial disease, okay? All right. So this is just another way of saying it, that um, if you look at mitochondrial disease and you look um, at their overlap with uh, autism spectrum, we have something on the order of 1% to 4%. And 96 to 99% do not have primary mitochondrial disease, but they could, you know, they're they do have secondary, you know, and many of them have secondary forms of mitochondrial dysfunction as associated as a, as a manifestation of this principle of metabolic matching that mitochondria, you know, orchestrate, okay? So, you know, that's, that's the exposure to the environment, that's um, their uh, bioactive chemical exposures in the, in the environment um, as well as um, predispos genetic predispositions. All right, so it's important to, to really recognize this because children with autism have a different response than children with mitochondrial disease to a variety of different you know, interventions. So valproate, for example, reliably produces deterioration when used to treat seizures and, and most mitochondrial disease, but 71% of children with ASD improved uh, um, in a paper by Hollander. Fever will reliably produce deterioration in patients with mitochondrial disease. But in a study by Curran, about 50 to 80 percent actually had improved language um, and social engagement um, in children that, with uh, autism and fever. Um, hyperbaric oxygen reliably produces uh, either no effect or deterioration in children with primary forms of mitochondrial disease, but 30 to 80 percent improved um, according to a paper by Rossignol. Spontaneous recovery, as you might imagine, of genetic forms of mitochondrial disease is extremely rare. But in autism, autism really is a treatable disease, and, and you know, the quoted numbers for, for recovery are 3 to 25 percent. So it's actually good to be able to have a secondary dysfunction disorder that you can potentially treat by eliminating the environmental trigger and knowing more about, you know, the the kind of individualized, personalized uh, response of each child to their environment. Okay, I'm, you know, I'll go through this quickly because I'm running down to five minutes of slides and I wanted to give you a, a little bit of uh, ecogenetics at the end. But I want to emphasize the point for those of you who haven't seen this talk before, is that not only do every, every tissue have different mitochondria for that tissue, but every tissue has a different number of mitochondrial DNAs. <laughs> that determine the work capacity. So in this first line, we talk with a secondary oocyte of, you know, and I say 0.9, but it's, you know, 0.2 to 2 million um, uh, mitochondrial DNAs. And then what happens in the embryo, okay, you start out with that, you know, say 2 million mitochondrial DNAs and, you know, and the, and the zygote and the male, the contribution to, to 
actually about 50 mitochondrial DNAs brought in by the sperm, but they are killed you know, after the eight cell stage of development. So you're only left with the mitochondrial DNA um, of uh, your mother. Okay, so, so um, and it, uh, average unrelated people here will have about 30 to 50 different, you know, uh, differences in their mitochondrial DNA, but you'll all be clones of your siblings that are, you know, through which, you know, you share a mother, <laughs> okay? Um, anyway, so as, as you start dividing, you actually have non-replicative divisions of mitochondrial DNA. So you go from, let's say, a million to a half million to 250,000 mitochondrial DNAs. And the very first tissues that start appearing and taking form, um, you know, in, in the growing embryo are the ones that actually do have the highest numbers of mitochondrial DNA contents, you know, like the heart and the, you know, cerebr and the, the um, central nervous system, okay? So... Cardiac muscle has about 6,000, CA1 hippocampal neurons about 6,000, quadriceps skeletal muscle about 3,000, adipose 2,000, um, white blood cells about 400, and skin fibroblasts about 100. Okay, leave it at that. There's a concept of heteroplasmy, it's important to know. Not all your mitochondrial DNAs have to be identical. Um, you can have point mutations in mitochondrial DNA. Our repair mechanism, so normally you're born with um, what's a condition of homoplasmy, which is 100% of your mitochondrial DNAs are, are wild type or normal, okay? Um, but there are children that, that are born um, with point mutations that affect some mitochondrial DNAs, but not other. So, so in this case of four mitochondrial DNAs affected out of 10, that's 40% heteroplasmy. Um, as you age, it turns out that our air repair mechanisms after about age 50 um, are able to keep, well, before age 50, they keep track of somatic, you know, mutations, are able to maintain, you know, um, uh, corrected mitochondrial DNA damage. But after about age 50, you start accumulating mitochondrial DNA point mutations and deletions exponentially until you die. It doesn't stop. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, there are over 200 different point mutations that cause mitochondrial um, uh, disease. We discovered one of the, well, was the first um, point mutation um, in mitochondrial DNA. It's this lysine tRNA um, mutation that's associated with autism in a, in a family. So this is that family. We published this in 2000. Um, so the, you can see the mother in blue here. She had a, a child that presented to us a little girl. Um, that, that circle over here that um, had a profound lethal form of mitochondrial disease called Lee syndrome. Um, we investigated her brother who had learning disabilities who actually had a regressive you know, um, uh, disease that was diagnosed as, um, uh, as autism. And uh, so this was the first case where we, you know, where a single mutation could be associated with, on one case, high levels of heteroplasmy, 82% in the female leading to uh, Lee syndrome, and lower levels of 60% uh, in the blood um, leading to autism in, a, in the child. And the other point that I want to bring out, okay, so the girl had decreased complex 4 and 5, but the, the boy, even though he had the same mutation, he actually had increases um, in his complex 1 respiratory chain activity. So overactive respiratory chain activity in response to, a, well, basically it's a compensatory response to a mitochondrial DNA mutation in this case. You can also have this over, you know, over, overactivity in response to non-genetic mitochondrial insults. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. I think I'm just going to whiz through the rest and get to, so so part of um, the, the, the point of this afternoon's talk is really to try to coordinate and emphasize the connections between um, our, our groups. And immunomitochondrial biology is um, uh, what I call the secret life of mitochondria. I mentioned already that I believe that the cellular defense function of mitochondria are more ancient than the, than the energetic functions of mitochondria. And as said by John Dryden in 1681, self-defense is nature's oldest law. If you don't survive, you know, um, then you don't, you don't pass anything on to, to the next generation. So mitochondrial control, the first steps in innate immunity. Um, there's a, a mitochondrial antiviral sensing protein that, um, that interfaces with uh, the Rig1 helicase, which actually binds to double-strand RNA and DNA, and that coordinates a phosphorylation reaction um, uh, that eventually results in um, uh, activating um, the interferon response factors three and seven that then go to the nucleus and coordinate interferon response of that cell. Okay, this is also involved in NF-kappa B activation. It, it's not obligatory, ob obligatory for NF-kappa B, but it is amplifies the NF-kappa B response. Okay. 
Off to the right, um, I have circulating, um, oh yeah, so, so MAVS is the mitochondrial antiviral sensing protein. So off to the right, I um, have an article um, that talks about mitochondrial um, DNA and mitochondrial uh, formulated peptides as um, uh, being um, damage associated molecular patterns when they are uh, released from the cell that are pro-inflammatory and I'll give you um, an idea what that actually means. So when damaged mitochondria um, are released um, their DNA and um, protein fragments are chemotactic, they actually call in neutrophils, call in phagocytes, activate um, phagocytosis. So on the left is a pipette that contains mitochondrial DNA and um, you can actually see the neutrophils um, chemotaxing to the tip of the pipette. So I'll show that a few times on the left. Um, and then on the right, you have the, uh, a pipette that's filled with the same mitochondrial DNA, but now um, you know, the, and the same neutrophils, but now we've added a, a protein, uh, an antibody to the, the um, alpha formal peptide receptor, the formulated methionine the, um, uh, peptide receptor. And you can see that the neutrophils just kind of hang out and talk to one another in coffee clatches. They don't do the same thing as they're doing over here. So, so over here, they're going right for the tip. And on the right, you know, they're just kind of hanging out. Okay. So, all right. I'm not going to, so we're running low on time. But I'll point out that there is a, um, a kinetics of um, response that primary mitochondrial disease has um, in response to infection that is different than um, what, uh, when children with autism spectrum disorders, you know, will have regressive events, it's frequently associated right with the, the you'll know, have a, a very exaggerated, um, you know, response at the time of peak fever. Um, and, but in mitochondrial disease, you'll have it as a delayed symptom um, uh, where there's a fade response that occurs five to 10 days after the peak of, of symptoms. Okay, where a child will stop talking, stop walking, stop being able to swallow, they'll have a stroke-like episode. It's a, it's a fade response. Where, and that's from bioenergetic failure because the real, real um, need for mitochondria really kicks in. Remember I told you that mitochondria actually dialed down with acute injury, okay? So it turns out they dial back up you know, during recovery and regeneration. That's essential for healing. Okay, and that's that regenerative phase is the phase where you know we really start seeing the the biggest uh, metabolic stress on 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 the kids with primary forms of mitochondrial disease, and that's where they really you know start uh, cascading into problems. Uh, there's also a flare response that occurs coincident with the, the uh, peak of of seizure or peak of uh, infection inflammatory response. Um, uh, at you know between one and three days, and that's due to an exaggerated immune response, and that's something that um, you know was uh, characteristic of the Hannah Pauling case that brought um, really mitochondria and, and autism together uh, in the in the newspapers in 2008. Um, then there's also something called a storm um, uh, that occurs really with um, within the first few hours um, that can extend for, extend for days um, that occurs. Um, with, uh, you know, uh, in a, as a memory response or anamnestic response. And that, that's something that uh, occurred in the very first patient um, uh, subject of, of gene therapy was Jesse Gelsinger, who had OTC deficiencies, deficiency. He was given a, um, the OTC gene and the adenovirus vector. Um, it turns out he was previously immune to the adenovirus vector, which is a, um, a, a you know, relatively common cold virus. Um, and uh, he developed disseminated intravascular coagulation shock and, and died. Okay, finally on to the, yeah, <laughs> something that I really wanted everybody to, to, to be awake for. So anyway, this is equigenetics. Um, it's the study of genes that interact with environmental factors to, to lead to health and disease, and it's also the study of the environmental factors that, you know, that interact with those genes. Now, so... So remember, so autism is kind of interesting. It's a moving target. If you go back and you plot the, you know, the prevalence of autism g g dating back to 1990, and, and you, know, you can actually create a very nice exponential curve that goes through about 2005, you know, with 18%, 18% uh, growth per year, okay? And then it starts falling off a bit. 
Okay, it starts falling off a bit from there. And so whether that means that we're, we're kind of coming to a new equilibrium with our environment or our environment is getting better or what's happening, it's hard to say. But I've been told, and the next slide tells me this, you know, from Autism Research Institute statistics that 80% of the, the patients in the U.S. with autism spectrum disorders are under the age of 22. Okay. And if there are anybody with better statistics than that, I, I, I ask them to, to come tell me to correct this, but this is the number that I have, and it's really kind of a shocking number. <laughs> okay. So what about uh, the ecogenetics of mitochondrial DNA? So, so uh, we evolved in Africa, and, and then our ancestors you know, moved to, to um, the Middle East and, and Northern Europe and Asia and crossed across the Bering Sea um, into the Americas. That all occurred tens of thousands of years ago. Okay, um, but our ancestors dwelled, like Moses will dwell in this land. We, are, we dwelled in, la in a land. <laughs> um, uh, you know, our ancestors dwelled in, and became part of that land, um, uh, you know, a, a thread in the, in the web of Chief Seattle and Chief Seattle's web. Um, and uh, we, we learned to, to live with the nutrients in that environment. We, lived to, we learned to um, survive in the presence of the different, um, you know, microbial environments. In the cases where there was malaria, we developed, you know, resistance to, to malaria. And, um, and where tuberculosis was common, we developed resistance to tuberculosis. So, um, uh, but what happened recently in the last 300 years um, is that we had this massive exodus from you know, northern Europe and, and um, from Africa to the North America. And that brought in genes that had all co-evolved with their environments you know for thousands of years earlier into a new environment with new you know new food sources and and you know uh, new viruses and bacteria and fungi to evolve with um, and then just as we get good at that then we ch change the game again and start you know um, with dramatic changes in the way that we do farming uh, the, where in the way that we do um, you know, uh, um, well, that we do our fishing, <laughs> you know, where concentrated animal farming operations, you know, really are producing, a, you know, more and more of our, our food supply. And we're, you know, using the powers of our brain to generate chemicals that, that we've, you know, that our, our environmental history, our eco, you know, our evolutionary history has never encountered before. Okay. And so we're now we're having to readapt, okay, to, you know, to this changing environment. Something that's you know really interesting that, that's put this in in um, sharp relief for me is I, I do some you know, uh, some collaboration with investigators in, in uh, India, and India is dominated by this so-called M uh, you know haplogroup of mitochondrial DNA, but before about 30 years ago, well so in fact you know as little as. Uh, 20 years ago when I first went to Bombay and just, you know, was sitting in the, the, the airport, you know, fewer than 10% of the people were obese. Last year I went there and 30% of the people in the airport were obese. Now it turns out there's an epidemic of diabetes and cardiovascular disease in India. It's also happening in China. You know, this is, this is you know, um, ongoing um, uh, ecogenetic disease that is occurring because our environment is changing faster than our genes. Okay, and I'll, I'll bring this home for, for autism in particular. So with the, you know, the political unrest in Somalia, a number of refugees went to Kenya um, in 1993. And in 2005, uh, a, a large population, um, well, actually a large population immigrated to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, in the, the, the mid and late um, 1990s. The... the the prevalence of autism in children in, in uh, that original Kenyan population or from Somalia was less than one in a thousand. But in 2005, the, the, um, the prevalence of autism in uh, Somali Americans, first generation Somali Americans was one in 60. So the statistics were actually kind of interesting. So in, in 2005, you know, there was a, a prevalence of autism among Caucasians and Hispanics that's a little bit, you know, well, significantly lower than currently, than we talk about now as 1%. It was 0.17. And at that time, it was just 0.28%. Uh, um, well, excuse me. And so, and it rose to 0.28% by 2008. 
but one to one and a half percent of the first generation Somali Americans, you know, um, had autism, and that started falling um, back down to, in 2008. So this is all statistics from the Minnesota Department of, you know, of Health that, can, that you can actually access on the web. So if you look at this, there's a, this is a, another example of the, the moving target of, of autism and this ecogenetic adaptation that's occurring. So, so in the beginning, the risk, of, uh, the prevalence of um, autism among Somali Americans compared to, to non-Somalis was nearly seven times greater than, than you know, seven, sevenfold greater. In 2006, it was fivefold greater, and in 2007, it was threefold greater. <laughs> okay, so there's a there's a a, a an adaptation that's occurring, um, you know, uh, before our very eyes here, as you know, this new genetic population is adapting to their environment. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. The Autism Research Institute depends on the generosity of its donors, like you, to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you.